You can see a lesion here in the cecum. I just arrived, so I'm just looking at it now. And I'm giving gas, uh, CO2, just to show you what it looks like with the gas view. And we'll go underwater in just a moment. Um, it was advertised as two and a half centimeters. Eh, it looks a little bigger than that. I think you will agree. Um, can I get this on block? I'm going to try. Uh, that is my goal. But, uh, but we'll see. All right. Now, in terms of the gas view here, uh, unfortunately, you see I've got some paradox here. So I'm going to I'm push I'm going to push in to get a little closer. Uh, this looks like a kudo. I'd say it's a three L and a four. I don't think it's a five. I don't really see any dropout of pit pattern or abnormal vessels. So there's nothing here that looks concerning for invasive malignancy, but it's definitely, I'd say, a Kudo 4. That's based on the heterogeneity of the pit pattern here. You see that you see various populations of, uh, of, of pits here. Uh, let's go underwater now, all right? And let's see what this looks like underwater. So I am aspirating out the gas. By the way, this is an adult colonoscope. It's the Q190. So I have near focus and I'm going to go on near focus now because that's going to allow me to really see this uh, with better resolution. So that's poor man's magnification. And so here now we can see very nicely how everything sort of floats up. You can see the pit pattern even better. You can see that these are branched pits. And we can also look at this with MBI. Looks very nice. And I didn't really see any truly depressed areas. I think it's just that this is so villous that uh, there are areas of relative depression and then more polypoid parts like this here. All right, let's take the NBI off. So the question is whether uh, to take the time to make some uh, dots around the perimeter. I don't think it's necessary in this lesion, but I always do it for SSAs because the margins are difficult to see. But I'd like to show you how I make diathermic dots around the perimeter. So this is the sheath of the 33 millimeter snare, and you can look through there. You can see it's transparent. And I pull the tip of the snare until it's flush with the tip like this. And then using soft coag, I actually use the catheter to, because some of this is overhanging, right? So I just use the catheter to pull over like this. Let's take the near focus off. And then I'll make a dot like that. So you can see a dot there. And then I can make a dot here. You can see the dot. They're nice and crisp underwater. You can make a dot here. So really, even though I'm not seeing exactly where the transition point is, I'm using the catheter to pull this over and give a little bit of water and then make my dot where, I, where the mucosa is normal. Here it's normal. And what so are you your preferred uh, dots? How we can make those dots? Settings. Let's just do, show you. And you can see that so precisely, pull the snare back a little bit. So you want it always flush. You don't want to create holes here. Now I can go on. Because, Jeannie, can you give a little water as I'm doing this? Ken, this is just you hear me? how the resolution is just so exquisite here underwater. And I can really go right next to the lesion, right at the margin. All right, so in the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to make dots around the entire perimeter. Let's see Ken, now. Can you hear me? If you can, can you explain to yes, us? Yes, now what, I what can. Your... I'm sorry, Raman. Go ahead. No, no worries. I was just going to ask you for our audience. What are your electrosurgical unit settings when you're making those? Yes. Products? So I'm using pure cutting current, auto cut. It's a, if you can get the volume up in my room so I can hear a little bit better. I'm using a auto cut and uh, effect five and wattage, I believe, is 80. Is that correct? In fact, I'll check that myself. Yes. Auto cut. Effect five, and then force coag if I need to coagulate. Now, this is going. This is a very vascular lesion, so I do expect to encounter some bleeding afterwards. So we have our hot biopsy forceps ready. So let's open up the snare. I'd like to get a sense 
with the floating effect, maybe, just maybe, I can capture this on block. And that's always my goal, on block with the contraction. Open Genie. So I have Genie next to me on my right here. I have Kristen to my left. And what I'm doing now is with the snare, I'm going to try to scoop that overhanging part and scoop it in and then draw it over to the other side. And just spend a little time wiggling. 33 is the largest snare that I have. And I'm just jiggling now and just trying to get, see if I can get the whole, whole thing in. Now I may have to do this piecemeal, but really more like a trimming of the side. And I'm torquing and seeing what, and this takes patience, right? This takes a little bit of time. Uh, you can see it's overhanging quite extensively on the right side. So it's questionable whether I'll get that. But, you know, there's a lot that overhangs. So let's see if I can just scoop this up here and then push in. There's a little bit of paradox here. See, a lot of this is floating. I'm really taking advantage of this floating effect. And then I'm just going to turn. It. See, I've already got that right side. A lot of this, it's almost like optically it looked so big. It is big, of course. But the actual surface contact with the mucosa may be much less. And I'm just going to, you can see here, I'm just pushing back and forth. And I'm just trying to maximize the amount of adenoma that I can capture in the snare. Now, what you can do now is just start to close. And so Jeannie's closing now. You can see that here. Maybe, yeah, she's closing. And what I'm doing now is I'm strangulating off the blood supply and I'm at the for discoloration. And that's an indirect way of assessing whether I have the entire lesion or not. You know, if there's part of it that looks whitish, you know, more pale, then I didn't get that. So if you look at this, my sense is it looks pretty violaceous already, a little, you know, reddish, right? Yeah. And yeah. now I'm just going to swivel. And yes, you can I see, can... Ken, you're right, that the base is a lot smaller than the top because... Yes, it was to see, right? Right, you can yeah, see it as you push out how nicely you're showing that on the right side. Yeah, so now what I'm doing now is I'm pushing this air out and I'm just going, going to sort of wiggle or I'm just swiveling, you know, like a rotisserie, just swiveling around to look. And when I have dots, I'll look for those dots on the perimeter as well. In this case, you know, I didn't complete the dots as you can see, but otherwise I look for those dots to see whether I got the dots as well. Goal, and this is, where I see the advantage of the underwater technique is that I can um, I can get a higher on block resection rate. I think the literature is starting to validate that that we're getting higher on block resection rates, and that after all is the weakness of EMR versus ESD. Is that more often ESD, of course, promises on block, but if we can accomplish that uh, with EM with the EMR technique, then you really don't have uh, that strong of an argument for ESD anymore. All right, now, we're ready to resect this, I think. All right, now, I'm just debating whether, because this is very vascular, and there's going to be bleeding, and is there advantage to maybe starting with some coagulation first, and then switching, or maybe even just using coagulation? I'm actually going to switch to uh, force coag. I'm going to use force coag for this, but let me tell you, we have the th the what's what's called the um, the heat sink effect of underwater, and that limits the the depth of thermal injury. We're in the cecum; it's thin here, but everything's contracted. We have maximum wall thickness preserved. That's the advantage of underwater, right? The rationale for some mucosal injection is to counter the effect of gas insufflation that distends and thins out the wall. So there is no submucosal injection here. We can preserve the native thickness of the cecum. So I'm less concerned about thermal injury and perforation uh, here due to thermal injury. Now, of course, there's always a risk of perforation, but um, 
if if you just move back and forth like this, uh, it looks like it's moving very nicely. And then it's a leap of faith. I know that with EUS, when I've uh, this is how I started doing this, that the muscularis propria stays round on the outside. So I'm just going to use force coag in this. I decided to change because I think if I use auto cut, even though that's my normal setting, I'm probably going to get bleeding, and I may still get bleeding with force coag. All right, I think we're ready now. Everyone's holding their breath, I'm sure. Okay, now while I cut through, by the way, I have my assistant. She's going to step on the water pedal just so I get constant water flow in here. All right, and let's let's go for it now. Cut. Keep going there, and I think it's through. It's through. Let's look. All right, let's see what it looks like. And what I do is wow. I immediately give water and look. You see, this is the actual surface area. It wasn't that huge lesion. Here we have a little bit of bleeding. Now, uh, if we had that Japanese uh, solution gel, we could see it beautifully, but now it's just going to cloud up. So I'm just going to switch to gas now. And with the hot biopsy forceps, I'll coagulate that vessel. But then you'll have a chance to see what this looks like with, um, with gas. So now I have to, of course, aspirate out the water and switch out for the gas view. All right. Well, I think and that, then was a nice, that was a nice example, Ken, because, you know, you spent a lot of time carefully uh, assessing the lesion and, and, and took out really a, an enormous amount, perhaps even all of it, um, just in a it's, single specimen. But unlike, uh, you know, most of the time we use 15 or 20 millimeter snares, but you actually used a much larger one to get around it. I use the 33 effect. almost all the time. So right. well, now we when you go to gas, you have to take off the near focus, right? And uh, because otherwise it's out of focus. And, um, but the near focus is made for underwater. So I do my entire colonoscopy underwater. So it's water exchange. I'm putting, I basically have my, my foot on the pedal um, infusing water. All right, there's our huge polyp here. It wants to go back home to its origin. Um, I'm going to try to push it away so that I can see the surface here. And this is just the part that I always find frustrating. It's the exchange of either gas for water or vice versa. So I'm just going to start giving more gas so I can see that surface. And if necessary, I'll have to grab that, that lesion here and pull it a little bit over. But it looks like the bleeding even now is starting to die down. And let's see, because there's a pool of fluid right here, right in my, right, uh, impeding my view. But if sometimes underwater, you, you can see if it's not bleeding too vigorously and you go really close like this, kind of push your cap. By the way, I always use a cap. Uh, if you push up against the surface, then you can, you can see the base, the area. Yeah, sometimes the pressure of the cap can lead to some tamponade itself, right, so. Yeah, so wh what I'm gonna do now, uh, and I'm sorry, this would just take a moment, but I'm gonna pull this polyp that I resected down a little bit, just to get it out of the way. And I just suck it into the cap uh, and pull it down. Now, it's so big that, um, and I'm getting this paradox here, so I have to have my, Assistant, give a little bit of abdominal pressure. I had already difficulty getting into the cecum because of looping, uh, but fortunately, we got in there. I mean, the last part of this is the closure. So I always close these lesions. I just need to stop, you know, get that blood vessel that's still oozing probably. And then after that, let me take the biopsy forceps out. Uh, obviously, this big polyps in my way. And so I want to just suck it into the cap and pull it, if possible, down, right? So I, I think I've got it. And now I'm just towing it down and do the ascending colon, and then I'll deposit it here. And now hopefully it won't follow me. Sometimes you end up pushing it back in. My assistant is giving pressure because of the looping that I'm getting. You can see the, the paradox that I'm getting, right? So I'm pushing in and it, it goes backwards. 
So she's giving a lot of pressure. Let's see if I can just kind of push through here. Here we go, maybe. What, the polyp's still there? <laughs> or is that some residual? I think that's the polyp. It just went back into the cecum, that's all. So let's pop it off for a second here. With the syringe, I'll just, or maybe it'll fall off. There, it fell off. Now let's try this one more time. Hopefully it won't follow me. All right, let's sneak our way back up, snake our way back up into the cecum stealthily. And Kristen here is working very hard with pressure because she was she was really hard to get to. Okay, here's here's the resection surface. Look at it here. Looks beautiful. And let's see if it's still bleeding though. I think it is still. One moment. And now I can get the hot biopsy forceps ready. Although I just fell back a little bit. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. Really working hard so that I can get back in the cecum. Okay, now let's just hold this position. I'm, I'm also squatting here to hold my position. And... Um, okay. Let's see if we can see that yeah. bleeding point. But so, look, you yeah, but it's amazing, gas? Ken. That... You, you can see how there, there's a bleeder right there. Okay, yeah. so let's get that, Jeannie, before we lose our view open. Now, here's what's important. Uh, if you grab, close, close. No, I didn't grab it. Open. Close. All right, there you go. Now, you have to always tug, and you can use soft coag. Of course, coag, I'm using force. It's fine. Just pull, you have to always tug a little bit and don't give too much. Something wrong with our settings. Moment. Okay. So we're checking the pad. The pad is maybe not on correctly. Get that muscle. It's very thin, very thin. So you just make sure you never do coactive coagulation, right? That means no pressure. You have to tug and let's try now. Yeah, we go. Here we go. And just wait a little bit till it open. Now, I think that's enough, close. All right, now I'm just going to quickly suck out some of the blood here. And yeah, then and I'll it, rinse off. It looks like we're, Look we're coming that. up to really the end good. of our time. Yeah, it looks amazing, because I don't, I don't think uh, it would have been hard to imagine uh, getting that on block without using underwater, because that was a- Well, is it possible, problem. Robin? I'm going to clean this out really I have to show you how I close these defects uh, using a new clip that I'm a big fan of now because uh, I just love it. And um, if you could come back to me, I'll clean it all out. And then the clipping will be literally just one minute. Okay, uh, I, I will check to see if we can do that. But uh, yeah, that was a terrific demonstration of, uh, of underwater EMR and how uh, you can really remove some things on block that uh, you traditionally would not have been able to do. And a very I'm, nice- I'm quite certain this was on block. And in addition, um, when you give gas, the surface area is going to become much larger, right? It looks so yeah. small underwater, yeah. but actually, yeah. you no, know, it does have a large surface attachment. Uh, but uh, underwater, everything's contracted, and that's what allows us to remove these lesions, these very big lesions, even uh, on block. Yeah, really and beautiful. I definitely inspect the margins and make sure there's nothing left at the margins. I have okay, to well, be the bad you, guy again. I'm sorry, Ken. This was a wonderful <laughs> presentation. Uh, you, you have to get uh, suck the blood out, and but we trust you all that it's on block and it's wonderful. Thank you. I'll Thank you show very much. I'll take proof of it afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Ken. You.